When it comes to race conditions, you either know what you're doing or you don't. If you don't know what you're doing, you're leaving yourself open to potentially some nasty issues that could happen in production. Your data is going to be messed up. You're going to need to go fix that data. You're going to need to bring down your service and fix that. Me nor any other developer want you to be in the situation. That's why in this video, I'm going to show you how to simulate and test race conditions and then how to avoid them, including in a distributed scenario. My name is Anton. Welcome to the Raw Coding YouTube channel. Let's go ahead and take a look at this example. And don't forget, if you're enjoying the video, like and subscribe. We will start off slow and then pick up the pace, starting off with what is an actual race condition. For a race condition to happen, you need some kind of resource and for now, this can be a number. And then you have multiple processes working in parallel. Let's say that this is worker one and he picks up the resource. We will then have worker two that is going to pick up the resource as well. Worker one is going to do some work on the resource. And then worker two is also going to do that work on the resource. They then go ahead and place whatever work they've done back into the resource. Well, then console, right line resource to the console dotnet run and we're going to see one being printed to the console a classical race condition although performed sequentially but essentially this is the formula shared resource multiple things performing work on that shared resource let's stick with this example we are going to have a number and we're going to start off with it being zero. First of all let's say that we want to perform some kind of work so we're just going to take the number and increment it Let's output this also to the console. To begin with, we will start off with a for loop and we will increment it a thousand times. Essentially taking a thousand workers and lining them up in a queue to perform work on the number. If we run our application because everything happens sequentially, there is no race condition here. A thousand is our successful result. So if we have a race condition and we're solving it correctly, we should get a thousand hundred percent of the times. Now this is running sequentially. If we want to take this operation and place it on a thread to run in parallel, we would have to go to task and call the run function, supply a Lambda, and then put this work inside of the Lambda. If we format this code, open up the terminal and actually forgot a semicolon over there. Let's rerun the application and we're going to get zero. The lesson to learn here is that the time it takes to create a task, put it on a thread and then actually run that thread is going to take some time. There is resource allocation there that you cannot just ignore. The time it takes for .NET to put this task onto a thread is longer than the rest of our application and our application finishes early. If we actually want to wait for this task to finish, we have to await on it. But now we're kind of in the same sequential situation where we're taking a task, we're putting it on a processor, everything happens there sequentially, and then we're just waiting for that to complete. So really what we want to do is schedule a thousand tasks instead of doing a thousand iterations on a processor. So these are going to be a thousand tasks that will potentially run in parallel. If we run the application now and we still get a thousand what is happening here is we're taking a task we're putting it on a thread and it is running in parallel and with the await keyword we're waiting for it to finish so that is going to do a single incrementation we're going to come back and we're going to do the same so we're just putting all the tasks and we're waiting for them to finish we actually want to stop waiting for them and as we put the task just carry on creating tasks and putting them onto other threads to run in parallel. Now if we run our application at this point we may see some kind of number, we may see a very small number but the results are random. If I actually run this enough times we may see a zero. The reason for that is while we're looping we're creating a task and we're scheduling it. It doesn't mean that the task is actually going to run. Remember that we need to await on the task in order for it to actually complete. For this reason, we're going to take all of the tasks that we're creating and we're going to store them in a list. Once we have aggregated all of our tasks in this collection, we want to use task when all to await on all of these tasks to complete. Here we will say await. Let's run the application now. And now if I run this a couple of times, uh, the situation that we should see is that most of the numbers are going to stay in the upper bound. At this point, we are seeing a race condition. However, our simulation is not quite correct. 
See, what might happen is as we're kicking off a task, it is going to go ahead and perform its work. If the thread pool is actually going to organize the tasks in a manner where we kick off a task, we add it to the list and it completes. If we kick off the next task and we add it to the list and it completes, hopefully you see the pattern here that all of the tasks will indeed still run sequentially. As we can see from the console, the chances of that are going to be very low. And I'm going to say it here right now that this is going to also highly depend on what kind of CPU you have. So the results that you may see when you're running a race condition like this may vary from system to system. Nevertheless, the problem that we're outlining here is that the operation of interest is the incrementation of the number. The thing that is running in parallel is scheduling of tasks and then executing those tasks including with our operation. We want to narrow down the scope to our specific operation. How do we do that? Well, if we take a look at an Olympic race, we have a gunman that is standing there with the gun. And then when he fires the gun, all of the racers go at the same time. We need our own personal gunman and we do that with a semaphore. So var semaphore equals new semaphore slim. We're going to give the gunman zero number for the amount of times that he has shot. And then on the semaphore, we are going to call wait a sync. Notice that we're not going to await on this. And this is going to be our gunshot. The place where we want to await on the gunshot is going to be inside the task. We will also have to make this asynchronous. And if we run our application now, it is actually just going to hang because we never actually release the semaphore. So let's stop it here. Before we await on all of the tasks, uh, we want to go to the semaphore and release the trigger. This is going to fire the gunshot and all of the tasks that have lined up at the gunshot will go and execute the operation of interest for us. So running the application, we get our race condition essentially. So 700, 829 and uh, 803. We are getting a pretty good race condition here, although I'm going to say it also that I still have a chance of getting a thousand over here. And as correct of an implementation as this is currently, you can still get outliers. So it is important when you're testing for race conditions, you're running this simulation more than once. And one more very important thing that can be very overlooked in this area, we have a task.run and then an asynchronous lambda. What is happening over here is task.run is still coming with the workload of scheduling a task that is going to perform some work on the background. The work that it's performing is this asynchronous function. So we essentially have two tasks happening here and the perhaps a little bit of an unseen effect that could happen here is that not all of the tasks are actually going to be at the gunshot because they're being scheduled in parallel. So when we call release, not all of them may start at the same time. The way we avoid this is we take our asynchronous function and we say that this is the work that should be done. Instead of scheduling the task, we invoke the work function Every single time we loop, we're going to enter the function, we're going to arrive at the gunshot. And then because we're awaiting it here and we're not awaiting it here, the task will be created. The execution will sequentially reach the gunshot. The task will be created, added to the tasks and then the next looping will happen. This way, by the end of the for loop, we have insurance that all of the tasks have lined up at the gunshot. Hopefully you can see how for the simulation of the race condition, what we're trying to do is remove as much of that unnecessary work that is happening around scheduling of our work of interest, which is this number incrementation. So the only thing that is going to run in parallel is going to be this work. Uh, let's run the application now. We get 990, running this a couple of times, comes close to a thousand. So we can see the varying results. If I run this enough times, again, I can still see a thousand. I can still see the correct result. So it is important that you run this more than one times. And this is where the numbering incrementation really is 
the best and the worst example at the same time. It's such a small and quick operation. It is kind of like a boundary for testing. Is your race condition simulation actually good or not? And if you are seeing the correct results, you may think my simulation isn't very good. However, you can get the correct result regardless. So when you are simulating for race conditions, I'm going to reiterate this. You want to be running it multiple times. Now, for some of you that are sitting there and perhaps you haven't learned anything new, let's comment out all the semaphore stuff. Another thing that you can use for the gunshot is a C-sharp promise, something that you don't see very often in C-sharp. However, it can also be used to align all of your tasks. Let's create a promise. This is going to be a new task completion source. All we have to do is await on the promise task. And instead of releasing like we're doing with the semaphore, we go to the promise and we set the result. Bring up the terminal or running this a couple of times. And we're still getting the race condition where all of the tasks are aligned right before we have to do our work. Now, who the hell has number incrementation in their race conditions as the main problem? We're doing IO, right? You are communicating with servers, databases, file systems. That is where the race conditions are critical and are prime for messing your system up. This is why we have a saved number. We have a file we're reading from there, we're going to parse the number, we're going to increment it, and then we're going to write it back, okay? So if you have parallel file access, let's go ahead and see what happens. I'm going to take the saved number, we'll assign a saved number to the number, and then we're going to increment it. If we run our application with a race condition, we're going to get an exception, right? So if you get a race condition on file access, you will see this issue. So what synchronization methods do we have in C Sharp? First and foremost, we have the lock statement. This will require some kind of object. This can be an instance of anything in memory. We place the object in the lock. And the main thing with the lock is that you cannot put asynchronous stuff here. So you will have to make it synchronous and actually await on this. So you will have to do like get a waiter and then get result if we run the application. And the application is essentially hanging. What we're experiencing here is called thread starvation. I'm going to cancel the application and we're going to talk about this a little bit. Let's say we have created 10 tasks, nine of which are going to run into the lock and one is going to get into the get results. And then we only have five threads to run. The first task acquires the lock and then because there is asynchronous code inside of it, the thread is going to relieve control of it and pick up another task. And all of the other five tasks, while this other one has been relieved control of while it was reading a file or something like that, the five lock tasks will congest the threads and starve them. If you want to simulate race conditions with a lock, instead of tasks, you will need to create threads. What's going to happen with tasks is once a task is on a thread, it does not get swapped out for another task. However, if you have multiple threads that are locked, and let's say you have a thousand threads, what the CPU, what the processor is actually going to do is called context switching. It's going to take one thread, pick it up and place another one on top of it. If you have a thousand threads that are locked, the CPU is going to schedule them one by one and over time, the lock will sort itself out. The lock will not sort itself out in the case of asynchronous tasks in this situation. So locks are essentially no good for us. Another way to do synchronization is by using a mutex. So a mutex equals new mutex. Kind of like the semaphore, if we take the mutex, we can wait for one, not the safe handle, wait one. And then by the end of it, on the mutex, we release mutex. Mutex can be used with asynchronous code. Let's remove the get away or get result. If we run our application here, we will experience thread starvation for all the same reasons because wait one is a blocking operation. In this situation, the mutex does fail, but however, a very good situation where a mutex can be used is if you have a computer and you have two applications on that computer and two of the applications are trying to access a file, instead of using a distributed lock, you can use a mutex to achieve synchronization between two different applications. The mutex will be provided by the operating systems, but then you actually have to request it correctly through the class and ask to try open an existing one. But that is beside the point here. Most of our applications are going to be asynchronous. And the main thing that we do want to be using for synchronization in our applications 
is a semaphore. We want to say that we have opened up the gates for a single process to enter. So we wait a sync, await, and then we're going to await for the incrementation of our number. Once we're done with the process, we're going to go to the semaphore and we're going to release. Let's run the application. And the application finishes. If we look to the number, it is a thousand. If you are again wondering how is it a thousand, when we create save number, we're seeding it with a zero, and then this is just happening a thousand times. Coming back to program CS, if we do remove the synchronization, remember that we're just gonna get a big fat exception. Now let's say that we're in a distributed scenario where we have a server farm, so 10 machines all trying to access the same resource and doing work on that resource in parallel. The way you do synchronization around a resource in a distributed scenario, one of the easiest ones that you can do is by using Stack Exchange Redis. So you spin up a Redis instance, a single one, and all of the boxes will talk to that Redis instance to acquire a lock. I've already added the Stack Exchange Redis package to it. This is what this is gonna look like. And I also have a Redis connection running. So if I type in Redis CLI and I look for all of the keys, Currently, it is empty. Let's establish a connection. So we are going to go to the connection multiplexer and we're going to connect. We are connecting to 127. This is our connection multiplexer. From the connection multiplexer, you want to get database. And this is going to be a DB. Let's comment out this work that we're doing over here. Let's again take our task. The way to do a distributed lock with Redis is you go to the database and you look for a lock. You want the lock take async. We'll await on this. You want this to be something unique, then you need some kind of sample value. And then you also need a timeout. What you don't want to do is set an infinite timeout. And then if the operation fails and you don't release a lock, you don't want your application to be deadlocked. So time span, depending on how long this operation takes, let's say that we are going to lock it for one second or maybe even 10, just to be sure. This operation is going to return a Boolean, so var taken, while this has not been taken, so it's not like the operation is gonna stop here and block, it's actually going to continue. So we wanna retry this, and you know, if you hear retries, Polly is what you want to use. However, what I'm gonna say is await task humble delay, and let's say for like five milliseconds. I'll also take this asynchronous operation and put it over here, remove the taken variable. So while we fail to acquire the lock, just wait for the lock to be free. Also, when you're performing your operations, what you wanna make sure you're doing is you're performing them in a try catch. And you always have a finally block, which is going to be responsible for releasing the lock. Same story with the semaphore release and same story over here. So to the database, we go again, we search for lock, lock release async. We put the same variables, number and the same value, place them here, semicolon on the end, await. And here is essentially our distributed lock. Let's come back to the application, rerun it. It's gonna take a little bit of time to complete, but in the end, we do get a thousand. And the reason it takes a little bit of time, well, we got all of these delays and there is a thousand of them. So, you know, it's a little bit expected. And that is pretty much all there is. In order to simulate a race condition, you wanna use some kind of synchronization to line up all of your parallel tasks right before you execute the logic, which might potentially contain a race condition. And then you start all of the tasks at the same time. In order to resolve a race condition, you can either use a lock, a mutex, a semaphore, or a distributed lock. For the distributed lock, I highly recommend Redis, although if you have any other database, you can get a distributed lock by using that database. If your database doesn't have locks but has transactions, you can create your own lock. Most of us are going to be working with running multiple tasks asynchronously. This is why I recommend you invest in the semaphore and don't touch the lock or mutex. And then if you have multiple machines running, you want to achieve synchronization by using a distributed lock. This will be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave it in the comment. You can also use the comment section to say thank you. But better yet, you can come support me on Patreon, get the source code, very big thank you to all of my patrons that are already supporting me. Your help is very much appreciated. Hope you all have a good day and goodbye.